Right, well, welcome everyone on Zoom and uh, everyone on YouTube. So we're looking today at 1 Peter chapter 2. That's 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims. Oh, hang on a minute, wrong place. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Scrap that, we'll start again. <laughs> we'll do it from chapter 2 this time, okay. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame therefore to you who believe he is precious but to those who are disobedient the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy, fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may be by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore submit yourselves to, everyone, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honour all people, love the brotherhood, Fear God, honour the King. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and Gentile, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully, Quiet. 
For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, when we've got his head around all that goes on in chapter 1, then he could put into practice what we see in chapter 2. So hence, therefore, everything that has gone before leads you to this. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babies desire them pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. When you leave your past behind and you accept Yeshua as your Saviour and Lord, when you surrender all you are and have to him, then you will find laying aside the things of the past a bit easier. Notice I said a bit easier. Unless the Lord actually touches you and takes it away instantly, Usually you have to work at it. And as the old proverb says, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Laying aside anything you need to lay aside needs you to take the first step. So let's have a look at these uh, things that we have to lay aside. The first one, malice. The dictionary tells us the desire to harm someone or wish them ill will. Quite, e quite often in people's life, you get hurt in various ways and that hurt grows into a deep-seated anger that can turn into hatred. And untreated, this can lead you to wanting to hurt hurt or even kill that person malice can ruin your life it brings you down it focuses anger on the other person it can take over your life and rob you of joy and enjoying life so you can see that this is something Definitely, that has to go. It will get in the way of worshipping the Lord. In fact, it can become your God. So how do we start with that first step? It's not complicated. We pray about it. And we take it to the Messiah Yeshua. And I've been told... That in your prayer time, if you speak out loud and forgive that person for hurting you, not just once, but every day, soon you will find your heart being changed and you will be able to lay aside your malice. The 
deceit. It says all deceit. The action or practice of deceiving someone by concealing or misrepresenting the truth. In Psalm 10, 7, 11, it says this, His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villagers, in the secret places he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He, lay, he lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. We all know he does see. So deceit can sometimes seem the right thing to do. Maybe deceit's a strong word in that situation. You do it with good intentions, when you don't want to hurt someone, or you think that they don't need to know. We might call it, I suppose in modern day terms, a little white lie. People in this world today are all about deceit. It gets them where they want to be. I'm sure we've all done it at uh, one time or another. And the newspapers and the news channels quite often manipulate the news to get their own agendas across. Political people, they don't tell lies but they don't tell you the full truth either. It's all about getting what they want. People want to promote themselves. They can tell you anything to make them look better. Deceit also plays a big part in the people who are truly evil. So how can people trust each other? How do you know you can trust? This is why you need to lay aside all deceit. This is why you must always speak the truth. People can only trust you when they know you are trustworthy. In your speech and in your actions. It's difficult when we work in the world I've only been retired a year, so I know exactly what it's like. You live in one world and you need to be strong. You need to be brave. But as the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. People might not always like your answer. But maybe eventually, not at the time, but eventually they will respect you for being honest with them. Deceit of any kind is dangerous, but please, please temper it with love. If you're telling somebody the truth, you know, just don't always blurt it straight out. <laughs> it's the way you say it. Right. Hypocrisy. The practice of claiming to have higher standards or more, more noble than is the case. Can you think of um, a group of people that were around at the time of Jesus? Like the Pharisees? Call them hypocrites, didn't they? And Yeshua does not like hypocrites. If you look at chapter 1, it says in there, As a Christian, you need to be who you are. Shine from the inside out. 
as you show Yeshua to the rest of the world? Being one thing in church and around Christians and then being another around your work colleagues or friends is not what Yahweh wants you to do. Your character should be the same wherever you are or whatever or whoever you're with. People should be able to see Jesus in you at all times. I know it's not easy. We all know it's not easy. And when you work, you get caught out and join in with the banter. I've got many t-shirts at home, as they say, with that on. I have a very sharp wit and sometimes when you work in an environment and they just come out with something, you automatically respond. It's difficult. That's why being retired is good, by the way. Because <laughs> you're not having to mix in those circles again. But it will be a constant battle. All your life, I tell you. But we need to persist and to try. Envy. A feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or look. Now, I'm not on about somebody drives past in an E-type Jack convertible red, and you go, wow, look at that. I'm not lusting after it, I just, I would like one. I'd never get one, but, you know, you never know. I was just saying to Sue, we could do a convertible. And she says, yeah, I'll have to prize me out of it. So that'll never work. But basically, when you compare yourself against other people, that's the thing, their possessions or their lifestyle, we don't need to do that. We are not like other people. We are like ourselves. Remember that. Peter in chapter 1 says to be content in all circumstances by focusing on Yeshua. Not being distracted by the things around us. Don't try and be someone else. It doesn't work. You need to stop worrying about what other people say about you. At the end of the day, the only opinion that counts is that of Yahweh. All things mentioned take you away from Yahweh. They stop you moving forward in Messiah Yeshua. You need to surrender all things to Jesus. Let him deal with these things within you. There is no other way to make permanent changes. Now then, evil speaking. I'm sure none of us here ever have done this in our lives. John Wesley, his definition of evil speaking is, for evil speaking is neither more nor less than speaking evil of an absent person. And in Titus 3, 2, it says this, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So I suppose the evil speaking really speaks for itself and uh, maybe a modern term would be backbiting, you know. If you're at work, you must not be come across that anyway. But if you can't say it to their face, then don't say it. Evil speaking is about someone it, you can, hurt, can get hurt. Because quite often, somewhere down the line, they tend to find out about it. But the ancient Greek word evil speaking, it has more of an idea of spicy and hurtful gossip. 
rather than the idea of profane speech. Verse 2. Now, last on, on Peter 1, I set off to do a sermon and ended up only doing the first two verses. But you'll be glad to know we've got a bit further this time. So, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Why do babies desire milk? Hmm? It fills them, it feeds them, it gives them the energy to grow, it protects them, and I presume to a baby it tastes good, not having tasted it for 50 odd years. <laughs> Since I was a baby, I, I couldn't tell you. Everything that a baby needs to live and grow healthily is in that milk. In the same way as Christians, we should desire the word of God. Because it does the same for us, as milk does for a baby. The baby's instinct is to find the milk. It should just be the same for us, with the word. Of course, just like that baby, which does move on to solid food, so should we eventually. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians around today who are still on milk. Or even at best, maybe mushy food in a, come out of a blender. They're definitely not on solid food. It's natural for a baby to do it. So it should be natural for a Christian to do the same. The solid food of the word is studying the word and getting to understand the depth within these pages. The word desire is a strong word to use, but in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses it in the form of a man's deepest longing for Yahweh. And we find that in Psalm 42. And some might recognize this because it, it's Sue's favorite song. Psalm 42, one. As the deer pants for the water brook, so, my, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. This is, a, this is a desire each and every child of God should have. Listen to this quote. The failure to either desire or to receive this pure milk of the word is the reason for so many problems in both individual Christian lives and in congregations. The sickly condition of so many Christians sets forth a, lament, a lamentable complaint of the food with which they are supplied. To say nothing of strong meat, they do not even get milk. Hence the church of God too much resembles the wards of a children's hospital. And that's Mayer who quoted that. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you have tasted or experienced the Lord's graciousness, then you have a responsibility to seek the word of the Lord. You are on your own walk, and only you are responsible when you come before the throne of God. You can't say they didn't tell me. Or, oh, I've never been told that. It's up to you to seek, to desire the pure milk of the word. Coming to him as a living stone, 
rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As we all know, Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. Everything comes from him and is built on him. So we have here in verse 4, Jesus being depicted as a living stone. Now he's not carved out a stone like most false gods you will find at that time and now. This is a spiritual stone, something not of this earth, but of heaven. Indeed rejected by men, but when building, an, when building a new building, the cornerstone has to be right. Am I right, Joel? <laughs> because everything is built from this stone. Jesus is that potential stone. But man has rejected this stone and thrown it away. Of course, we can see that the nation of Israel at this time wasn't interested in this cornerstone and rejected it. So the question is, have you rejected Yeshua as your saviour? I don't think anybody here has, have they? Good. Now, if you have, you're in the same place as the ones who rejected him 2,000 years ago. But this stone who was rejected, who died on the cross, he was chosen by Yahweh and is precious. When we throw things away and consider them junk, Quite often, someone else won't consider it precious. It all depends on how you look at things. The world has rejected Jesus. They say they don't need him. They do what is right in their own eyes. But when you have tasted his grace, you look at up upon him completely differently. He is precious to us. He is our cornerstone. The one that Yahweh has chosen. In fact, not only is Jesus a living stone, so are you. I bet you never thought of yourself as a living stone, have you? We are being built up into a spiritual temple with Yeshua as the chief cornerstone. We are only alive because we are linked to Yeshua. A stone on its own can't build something great for Yahweh, but once it is joined with other stones, it becomes a major part of the building. In the same way, when we are part of the spiritual temple, we become stronger and have a greater impact. God does the building and he puts us in the right place. He knows our strengths and our weaknesses. But think about it. An imperfect stone put in the right place works well. It's part of the whole and makes the whole stronger for being there. We are also a holy priesthood. The priests of the temple offered up physical sacrifices to Yahweh, but in the same way we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices through Messiah Yeshua. It is only through Jesus that we can do that. There is no other way. On our own we have no authority 
but linked to Yeshua we have. We no longer need a special person to go to, to come before God, because we can approach our own High Priest whenever we want to. There is only one mediator between man and God, and that is Jesus Christ. So if you come across someone professing to be a mediator between you and God, walk away quickly. Remember, no man has the ability on earth. No one was good enough. Only through our high priest, the living mediator, the heavenly mediator, can we approach the one and only true living God. As usual, these things are not new. And throughout and new thoughts in the New Testament, they are there, right back in the Old Testament. So on verse 6, 7 and 8. So therefore, it is also contained in the scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. And that's Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's Psalm 118, 22. And the stone of stumbling, a rock of offence, from Isaiah 8, 14. They stumble being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. So if we look at this, Jesus is the cornerstone in Psalm 118, the stumbling stone of Isaiah 8, and the foundation stone of Isaiah 28. He's also the supernatural stone of Daniel 2, and the rock that miraculously gave Israel water in the wilderness. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And in Matthew 21, 42 to 44, we read this. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the, word, the Lord's doing. And it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Is Jesus precious to you? Is Jesus a cornerstone to which you are attached? How precious is he? Are you like Charles Spurgeon? I don't know whether you've heard of him, but he's the, rated as the king of all preachers, if you will, preacher of preachers. When he preached his first sermon in a village cottage, he chose the text, 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, which believe, he is precious. Spurgeon said that he didn't think he could have preached on any other Bible passage. But Christ was precious to my soul, and I was in the flush of my youthful love, and I could not be silent. When a precious Jesus was the subject. Is Jesus precious to your soul? Does he come first in your life? Do you include him in all that you do? Remember, the answer you give reflects how precious he is to you. So think about it. When you're in your quiet time, 
And if need be, correct yourself. But if you find he is a rock of offence, a stone of stumbling, then you're lost. You need to get on your knees and pray for forgiveness and repent. Remember, a cornerstone has two walls coming from it. Usually at 90 degrees, unless you've gone really modern and got all sorts of angles in. But let's pretend it's at 90 degrees. They have nothing in common but the cornerstone that connects them. In the same way, whether a Jew or a Gentile, looking like we have nothing in common, when you put Jesus in there, we are all connected as one people. A new creation. Neither Jew nor Gentile, just one in Christ. Verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Who once were not a people, but are now a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we are part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Israel once had the exclusive rights on these things, but now Yahweh has chosen a new generation. And that is every Christian on the planet to share in these things. I'm not on about replacement theology. Just in case. A royal office and the priesthood never came together in Israel. They were always separate. But Yeshua has brought them together into one office. And we are privileged to be part of that royal priesthood. Remember that. And his own special people. What is it like to feel special? Eh? To be special. Because you are to God. We're special. We have been chosen by Yahweh to be his people. Does that make you think of what a privilege it is to belong to Yahweh? But of course, this can only happen through Messiah Yeshua. Now imagine a museum full of cars. Huh? Ordinary cars. Nothing special. And on the surface, they're just nothing. They're just normal cars. Until you find out that they belong to famous people. Well, suddenly, they become special. Well, in worldly terms, should we say. And suddenly that car becomes special. In the same way, we all look normal. Don't we? Nod, say yes, please. <laughs> we all look normal, don't we? We're ordinary people meeting in a building on a Sunday. But when you realise that we all belong to Yahweh, we suddenly become special because we belong to God. And why? Are we a special people? So we can proclaim, speak out the praises of God. Why? Because he pulled us out of the dark, muddy swamp of sin and placed us in a field of sunshine and warmth. Yes, into his marvellous light. Why would you want to keep quiet about it? 
when you really understand what he has done for you take that message and go forth tell everyone what a wonderful God he is now since it is true that believers have a new life principle shall we say your chosen generation a new access to God a royal priesthood a new government a holy nation a new owner his own special people it will affect the way the believer lives their lives we were not a people we were not a nation we were scattered all over the earth we all did our own thing but now we come together as one people, as one nation, because we are the people of God. No matter where we live in the world, when we accept Jesus as Lord of our lives, and repent of our sins, we become part of one family. God's family, a chosen people, a special people. And how did all this come about? Because we now have obtained mercy. And that's the difference. God's mercy, for without it, we were lost. We would have been out in the wilderness forever. Verse 11. Beloved, I, be I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy lusts which war against the soul. Having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter here is begging us to live the right way. Remember, we are only a people travelling through this life. We're pilgrims on our way to heaven. And this, he says, will help you. To abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Peter fully understands about the lusts we battle against. Now, this just doesn't mean on a sexual level. Okay? Okay. Lust is tend to be connected to that. But it could be drinking, could be gambling, could be pride, could be money. Just a few things that we battle against. There's lots more. Now let's be honest. Who finds battling against the flesh easy? No. It's not easy, is it? And if you do, please will you let me know into its secret. The pursuit of fleshly lusts can end up destroying our body, our mind, our life. They can become addictive, take over, dragging us down into the depths of hell. And we need to constantly war against it. And Peter here is suggesting that about looking at our journey through this life in the right way as pilgrims it will help us get through living a life that shows you are gods reflects on those around you your neighbors your work colleagues etc not only are we showing Christ to others we can get a good name you become known for telling the truth and doing the right thing when the evildoers speak against you people know you and trust your word and your actions then your reactions glorify Yahweh your life and your ways help to protect you against evil now, Christians were falsely accused of great crimes in the early church. 
Pagans said that at communion, Christians ate the flesh and drank the blood of a baby in a cannibalistic ritual. They said that Christians, agape feasts, that's love feasts, were wild orgies. They said that Christians were antisocial because they did not participate in society's immoral entertainment. Hmm. Could that be applied to today? Of course it could. They said that Christians were atheists because they did not worship, worship idols. But you know what? Over time, it was clear that Christians were not immoral people. And it was shown by their, by their lives. The striking fact in history is that by their lives, the Christians actually did defeat the slanders of the heathens. I'll give you a quote. In the early part of the third century, Celsus made the most famous and the most systematic attack of all upon the Christians, in which he accused them of ignorance, foolishness and superstition and all kinds of things but never immorality. Thirteen. Therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honour all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honour the king. As Christians... We should follow the laws of the land. We are called to be good citizens. Of course, this was very different from those zealous Jews in Peter's day who recognised no king, no God, and paid taxes to no one except Yahweh. Peter was around at, this, at the time of the Roman Empire when it was in control. They were not friends with Christians. But yet he still understood that they are to follow the rules set down by the Romans. The Jews only obeyed Jewish leaders. But Peter is saying, obey the authorities no matter what race of people they come from. Why do we obey the government? Because God put them there. And we are to pray for them. Unless, unless, of course, they order us to do something in contradiction to God's law. Then we are commanded to obey God before man. And we see that in Acts 44, sorry, Acts 4, 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge that. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And we are free in Christ, aren't we? We're always told we're free in Christ. Our sins are forgiven. But do not use that as an excuse to break God's law as you see fit. Because we are born servants to Yahweh. Now if you slip, that's one thing. We all do that. None of us are perfect, are we? I know I'm not anyway. But to go out of your way and use forgiveness as a cloak then you're out of order. 
and you will have to answer to Yahweh. I keep looking up at the clock and it hasn't moved since I've started. Does that mean I can carry on for hours? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not doing now, verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable, if because of conscience towards God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps. Ye who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, and when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who, bore him, who himself bore our sins in our own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. By those stripes, you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now this last section doesn't make for pleasant reading or hearing. Here Peter is calling for servants to suffer in silence. If they had a harsh master, be submissive to him. He says also that if you suffer for your faith, do it in a like manner. Why should they? And why should we? Hmm? Good question. We don't gain anything from it personally. The master won't give up beating you or the antagonist won't stop, sh stop shouting at you. Why should we suffer and not complain? Because Christ was in the same position, suffering for not doing any wrong. When we suffer, especially for our faith, it is commendable to God. What he is saying is that we are called to suffer. Because Jesus suffered for us. He was the example we should follow. He left things in the hands of Yahweh, who judges righteously. This should apply to us that when we are being attacked for our faith, let Yahweh deal with it. It's not up to us to seek justice. Yahweh will deal with it. We belong to the Almighty God, our Father. And like any good father, he will look after you. Paul preached this as he went round on his journey. If we accept that this is a possibility for being a Christian, and it comes, we, when it comes, we are more prepared. It's not nice. I don't want any. Do you? No, I want an easy life, me. That's what I'm all about. Just ask Sue. But knowing that we are called to suffer helps us through these times. Make sure your roots are deep and in good soil. But remember, Yahweh is in control and our Father who could, and our Father. So, who can be against us when God is for us? Amen.